Hello, and welcome to the next episode of Lost in Criterion. I'm J. Patrick Dorgan. Wait, that's not what I usually call myself. John Patrick Owatari Dorgan. And with me today is a man who's so popular, his pseudonym has a pseudonym. I am the Adam Glass, and Pat, I love that you can't even remember your own name. Well, with I, us I today usually also. use J. Patrick Dorgan as my it's name true. online. It's true. It's your email. Yeah. It's, your, uh, it's a lot of things. Um, let's, uh, let's not leave everyone... Everyone hanging with us today is also, once again, Stephen Goldmeyer, former contributor to io9 and uh, pop culture blogger in his own right. Hello. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you. But does it's his nice pseudonym have a pseudonym? <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know if he does. I'm I don't sorry. know if I even have the one pseudonym. Yes. You should get one. They're so awesome. You don't, you don't need to layer that much, I think. Yeah. It's, it's, it's for protection. Good to, it's good to, to keep the there. government the off your back, better. Adam. Oh. The yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's always good to have one fake name you can take off, just uh, just in case. How do we know uh, Stephen is not my fake name? Huh? You're right. I, I really don't. Did you it's... know that I have an AK now? Or AKA, oh, sorry, AKA, not AK. I forgot how to use it. I was going to say, an AK is a gun, right? I, can, you, can you legally own those in it's, Japan? It's, it's, it's 1030 at night, okay? Please cut me some slack. <laughs> uh, and I didn't sleep a lot last night. Um, no, because, you know, I changed my name in the United States, but um, the Ohio government is evil and yes. will not accept federal documents as proof of a name change. Yeah, Therefore, I have two names in the United States. Huh. Kind of weird. That is very weird. As someone who works for the uh, state government, by the way, I'll just chime in. I do not think, for the purposes of my employment, that the state government is evil. Do Uh, you work for the uh, Bureau of Motor Vehicles? And I do not, and I can, in fact, attest to their their evilness. Okay, yeah. Correction. The Bureau of Motor Vehicles of Ohio is evil. And I think no one's going to disagree with that, yeah. I don't, yeah. Yeah, that's going to be, yeah. That's going to be pretty yeah. general. Speaking, I of, mean, as cliched as it is, but yeah, yeah, well, everybody hates the BMV. Speaking of evil, uh, in, in today's movie, Black Orpheus. No, no, no. That's next week's. No, no. It is this this time. What? Yeah. What's going I'm on? I'm confusing them. I'm. I'm what confusing is going the movie. on this here? This is my fault. We're recording two episodes today, and I just confused them, and I ruined everything. You know Black what? Orpheus just burn the whole thing to the ground. I'll go delete no, the website. Pat. I'll, I'll I'll destroy all the files. I'll throw my laptop out the window. <laughs> Pat, you're overreacting. Oh, I think think it'll be okay. It. We've made worse mistakes than this. This week's episode is Black Orpheus, uh, 1959 winner of the Palme d'Or at, uh, at Cannes. Uh, Brazilian movie uh, made by Frenchman Marcel Camus, uh, based on the Greek myth of Orpheus and uh, Eurydice. Um, I believe I it is, I forget, Eury... Ah, oh, man. I've always said Eurydice. Yeah, yeah, they had the, they have a pronunciation guide correct. online. I went and looked it up because uh, I didn't want to get it wrong, and then I forgot. As we've learned in the past, I don't care about pronunciation, guys. No, especially uh, not about human names. Yes, like uh, like the episodes about the Samurai Trilogy, where we just ended up calling Inagaki Hiroshi, or Hiroshi Inagaki, rather, uh, Marty. Uh, <laughs> yes, because we just could uh, not handle it. <laughs> because I kept saying it wrong. Uh, anyway, this is, interesting fact, before we get too far into this, according to Wikipedia, Barack Obama's mother's favorite movie. Why is that on the wiki? What? I think it also says in the Wikipedia article, it's uh, the, the movie that inspires Theo Huxtable to go to Rio in the Cosby show. Yeah, the Wikipedia article for this movie is kind of weird. It is super weird. Oh, it's Eurydice. Eurydice. Yeah. Eurydice, a soft C. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah, and it, 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 it's a D instead of a D. So Eurydice. Eurydice. I can't say it now. Eurydice. Eurydice. All right. Well. Well, now we know. Probably end up calling her Jane. Yeah. Because that's how racist we are. Hey, now. Is it racist to give her a new name? 
It's racist not to uh, bother to remember her real name. No, that's just mean. (laughs) There's a chance that we're already on the border of racist because we're choosing the Greek pronunciation over the Brazilian pronunciation. Well, if if anybody caught the Brazilian pronunciation, I'd love it here because I couldn't catch it while I was watching. Well, they just called him Orphe and... uh, Well, yeah, I caught his name. really not mentioned that much. For as important as it is to, like, the plot of the movie, they don't say it a lot. It's basically just a vehicle by which the other characters can be like oh like the greek myth you know yeah yeah i mean i i I really i really do like uh how everyone's just kind of bemused by that yeah like despite the fact that the whole story is built on the structure of the myth and pretty well you know it's as far as adaptations of greek myths it 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 does a lot to hit the notes of the original without seeming like you know it's it's like west side story compared to compared to romeo and juliet it's it's its own thing enough Right. Or Romeo but West Side Story almost. doesn't doesn't also spend half of its time saying, "Oh, like the like gr- Romeo and Juliet." <laughs> yeah, like Romeo and Juliet. Well, yeah. here's the thing that bothers me. Okay, and I just want to get this out right now. Mm-hmm. I and I understand that this is fairly. It seem I don't know. I don't know the Greek myth very well. Okay, um, and this might be very true to the Greek myth, but I can't really like Orpheus's character for most of the first half of the movie. Um. Why? As a uh, because why? he's an asshole. <laughs> in what sense? Well, in the sense that he has a fiance, and he's and it's very Greek mythy. Okay, don't get me wrong. Yeah. It's yeah. it's very in line with that. But when you think about Greek myths as they apply to modern human values, mm-hmm. they don't actually line up super well. No, they don't. And yeah. it makes me not like the character as a person because he's being well, portrayed in a time that is modern, being that guy. It sounds like, uh, for, for those who have not seen or don't recall uh, the film, basically it sounds like what you're referring to is the fact that Orpheus does have this fiancé that he kind of right. doesn't care about. Um, right. But then he totally moves on to this other woman, and he's like kind of full of himself. and you know. Yeah, there's a lot of that sort of stuff. And yeah. I well, everybody's in love with him, and he plays that very, yes. very much. And all, all I would say is in the Greek myth, he is a god. Uh, so there's that. That's but, true. But, but also, I think even more importantly in this kind of story, uh, we are not supposed to like the fiancé, and we are supposed to see him as the hero. Because he, right. uh, spoiler alert, this is a tragedy, and in the Greek sense, tragedy means everybody dies. So yes. uh, right, right. we to see it tragically, we have to, you know, I, uh, The Room has its problems. The film The Room has its problems. But it's a similar thing. Uh, it borrows from the same school of thought, which is our hero is perfect and awesome and everybody loves him. And it's such a tragedy that he's dead now at the hands of fate uh, or, you know, death or uh, his crazy fiance or whatever. Mm, yes. um, so for the tragedy to really work, I mean, to a certain extent, he has to be that guy. But that's right. not to say you need to like him, right? Like, I kind of agree with you that he is kind of just a, you know, kind of full of himself, you know. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that's a problem right. for me. Like, I, I have this problem with movies in general. Is like, I'm fine with an antihero, but I need him to have redeemable ele- or, uh, redeemable elements. And for the first, what, 30 minutes or 40 minutes of this movie, I'm like, what's his redeemable element? Oh, he plays he the guitar really, really well? Eh, yeah. Not really. Um, and the thing is, is that like that isn't enough for me. And I don't dislike the fiancé for most of the, like, for most of that same period of time. I don't <laughs> yeah. see why she's supposed to be bad. It's, it's not that it's, I mean, like I said, it fits well with Greek myth uh, mythology. It just doesn't apply really well that particular element doesn't apply well in modern society well, well I, mean, I think there's a little disconnect to, to, to 1959 sensibilities from us too because I think what's supposed to establish from the beginning is us not necessarily liking her is that she's a little overbearing but she's just a little overbearing yeah that's the thing fiance. she's just a little overbearing yes, the fiance. and considering who she's about to marry she needs to be as overbearing as hell <laughs> Right, he's wandering off to new women all the time. She does right. kind of yes. need to be up in his face. Yeah, yes. I don't know. The thing is, though, like you know, the movie's kind. Of, the movie wants to portray her as like she only she wants the ring. She wants his name. She wants to be able to say, "I'm the one who tamed Orpheus." You know, like yes. the movie wants to portray her as not really having any interest in Orpheus himself. The same way that all these other women don't really have any interest in Orpheus himself. 
only in the idea of Orpheus. And not until Eurydice finally gets on the scene do you see somebody who really has a connection with him. I yeah, think that's I the way the that. movie wants it to be portrayed. I, you know, I'm not yeah. saying it's. I think it was successful for me, but I'm, I'm not saying it has to be successful for everyone. But I think that's what the movie wants. I can so. see that argument. I, I'm not going to disagree that I, I. I can see that as you pointed out that that they're going for that, and I hadn't thought about that really. The idea that like all these women who are chasing him are chasing him, kind of for the kind of that kind of notch in their belt kind of like the, they're the ones who for nothing yeah orpheus but at the same time it's really hard to read that even in her behavior i think because she yeah she's complaining about the ring and stuff but the way she has to browbeat him into doing it makes it just seem like less like she's super hyper interested in it and more like i can't even give him to buy me a ring for us to get engaged you know what i mean it's how it comes off for me but that right. again like that's just the way i'm reading it so I get that. I get that. I mean, you know, um, the, the movie's certainly at least interested in poverty, if not about poverty, which we can maybe yeah. talk about a little later. Uh, but uh, but the idea that he like takes home his pay for the week and he just wants to have have fun and play his guitar and be a part of the carnival spirit, and and she's like, no, you need to spend all that money on a ring for me. To me, that's kind of the. The, the dichotomy that the film sets up between right. like the culture and the fun of these people yeah. versus the materialism of this woman, you know, to me, I, I'm not. I, it's again not simple. I don't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say it's so obvious from the film, but it seems at least that's the film wants you to see a Orpheus as the fun hero of his culture, and this yeah, woman as that. as a problem to that. Yeah. So. Well, yeah, I think you're right there. Um, she's. She is, to that extent, an obstacle in the way of his... Exactly. Of his, of his and awesome as far as, Yes, and as far as Greek myths go, it's maybe right to think of things in terms of, you know, what are the obstacles on the hero's path? Uh, yeah. You know, and, and Mira, his fiance, is one of them, you know, <laughs> and like, uh, you know, all the all the women trying to chase him down there, another one, you know, and yes. all of those things are just obstacles on the hero's path to the eventual tragedy of losing his true love. And then as a result of that, his own life. I mean, that's, you know, I to. I, I, I think that there's something sort of not accessible and outdated about the Greek tragedy form, but I think as far as this this movie updates that, this movie does a fantastic job of making that whole form still feel pretty fresh and, and yes. you know, a little well, yeah, magical. Yeah, I don't have a problem with the all very... everybody dies at the end thing. I mean, that yeah. works for me fine. And by the second half of the film, I've forgotten that he's kind of an asshole, yeah. and I'm enjoying watching him and the story. But for that first 30 or 40 minutes, I'm like, man, this guy's a douche. <laughs> Just kept him from getting into it. Yeah, yeah, I get that. Well, you know, obviously that's, a, that's, a, that's what we call character development. Right, it, exactly. Uh, <laughs> yes, I understand that. But it also yeah. makes the first 30 to 40 minutes of the film borderline unwatchable for me because I have no character to connect with. Yeah. It's, you know, I, I suffer well, from that problem. What would you say is the turning point? You know, I think it's around the time that we actually get started with, like, where basically Mira drops off the face of the earth for a a chunk of the film and then comes back just at the end at Carnival. And when she comes back, it's obvious that she is an obstacle to be overcome at that point, okay? Like, it's no longer like, um, why is he doing this to his fiance? It's, oh, here's another obstacle. Yeah, right. so I'd say about about the time that she drops out of the film for a while, and I would it moves say, on to just Eurydice yes. and him. I think it's no coincidence that the, the point where you finally see uh, his sort of like his value at least, or you know the thing that's going on with him, is when he has or, or, or Eurydice in his life, right? Like that's mm-hmm. that basically to me the turning point of this film is. And it's uh, it's one of my favorite scenes that I've seen in a film in a long time. But the scene where he he goes outside and you know she says something like you don't even know me and he says I do know you and they, like he rests his face on her hand and they both are crying. It's just so like strange and magical uh, and oh, yeah. really touching. And it's not really clear even what's happening. But to me, that was the turning point where I was like, whoa. Okay. You know, this is this is all of a sudden like th- there's 
something important happening here. And that's the problem is like he doesn't know her. And without that kind of feeling of importance that's imparted by the mythological aspects, it just seems like kind of an empty romance story. Right. But because and that of the film's ability to play with those sort of magical mythological elements, that's what takes what could otherwise have felt like a pretty empty, uh, you know, uh, uh, for love at first sight kind of story into something really I thought, you know, deeply affecting and really cool. Well, yeah, and there's 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 a bit of symbolism in the scenes around that, mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, especially especially with the mythology, even within the film of uh, the little boys believing that uh, every morning Orpheus sings the sun into existence. Right, you he know, sings that scene in the takes sun. Takes place rises. as the sun goes down. Right, and in the morning when we wake up, they are in love. Yes, yes. And then he plays his guitar and the and sun he rises. Plays the guitar and the sun comes up. Yeah. It's gorgeous. It's beautiful. I mean, that's, you know, it's like if you think of this thing as sort of like a, more like a fairy tale and less like a, a West Side Story kind of thing, uh, mm-hmm. at least that's the way I was thinking about it. And it is just so rewarding on those terms, uh, you know. Yeah. Um, that, yeah. And obviously, my, my comparison to West Side Story was, was in the updated. Of course. Idea. Well, yeah. But I think at the same time, what you guys are talking about is also where it formed a disconnect for me. It's not that I didn't like it. In mm-hmm. fact, I enjoyed uh, Greek mythology a lot. But I prefer my Greek mythology taking place in Greece. Yeah. <laughs> at an appropriate okay. time. No. I don't know. It's, I have the same problem whenever like somebody updates Romeo and Juliet, for example. And it really bothers me because even those minor disconnects in, uh, as as you may have picked up in other podcasts, even minor disconnects in behavior, social behavior, uh, for time periods and stuff really start to gnaw away at me. Mm-hmm. And yeah. like even in 1959 in Brazil, I would still say that Orpheus would be considered a bit of kind of a rap scallion that not many people would like right yes but not during carnival yeah okay well, and well only... that's true but we so, but we get the impression that he's like this all the time well but and only yes. during the first 30 minutes of the movie right right like once once his heroic journey is apparent to him that he needs to you know that's save true. Eurydice, he's not that guy anymore you know, that's that, true. Uh, isn't yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure most greek myths start like you know uh um, I know, for for instance, that you know Wagner's Ring Cycle is all about the impetuous, annoying little kid who becomes the hero that has to save Brunhilde on top well, of the I hill. Well, I think I think you know? that sort so, of character growth is more indicative of more modern European storytelling. I think in a lot of more Greek myths, you start off with a lot of gods who are bad but are still gods and therefore still gods. No. And things like that, and so I think you get a little bit less of that, like, you're supposed to, because it is a form of, kind of a form of religious storytelling, you don't mm-hmm. have um, that sort of character growth. Yeah, and, right. And, 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 and so it's a little bit hard for me to, it's a little bit hard for me to deal with. I, I see, yeah. by the, at the hand-holding time is not when I, was a turning point for me. Mm-hmm. It was definitely... Um, forget when it was it was a little bit later for me but uh, yeah i mean it did turn for me once we got into sort of the meat of the action of the story but yeah. i think you could have told the greek myth without mira per se and that entire element because i don't know that that is really necessary for the myth to be retold i think that's just a way to characterize him at the beginning to create that sort of loose canon Greek god persona yeah. that I is valued in Greek disagree. gods. Okay. <laughs> I super disagree. Yeah. I, I mean, I understand what you're saying for sure. Like if, if uh, uh, approaching the story from the time period and from the culture of the time, it doesn't seem like she's necessary. But, you know, to me, like his his journey, like when, when Eurydice comes to town and his meeting her, that's a journey into something uh, something on a different realm, on a different plane, his journey into heaven, right? And so, 
Mira represents his sort of worldly, like, you know, this is, this is uh, the mundane love that he had. And then that sort of other dimension of love is what's revealed to him through Eurydice. And it's no coincidence that it is his journey into that heavenly love happens during Carnival, and then his eventual journey into the underworld to try and recover that love happens right at the end, right after Carnival. So, you know, mm. like, that's... Uh, I... I I, I totally understand. Like Mira, definitely struck me as one of the weaker things about the the way this story is presented. But I, I in, at least from my perspective, uh, she seems totally necessary to the to the journey that Orpheus goes through here. Hmm. Yeah, she she plays an important role in in how, what she symbolizes as as the the non divine love that he's right he's that he has very, to escape. Yes, and the very jealous love and the very. Yeah, I can see that. Dangerous love. But like what I said, I totally like understand not not liking seeing her on screen. I totally understand from like a, a, a like you said, a modern cultural standpoint, well, she does not it, seem good. For me, it's it's a little bit of both actually. It's a, it's a little bit of the modern cultural standpoint because it makes the movie seem strange to me. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, it's also combined with a little bit feeling a little bit odd in Greek mythology as well for me. Because I would more expect them to characterize him as that kind of recklessness without necessarily her and it to be mostly a play of him against fate. Sure. Rather than him against her and then against fate. But I see what you're coming from with the with the divine love versus uh, earthly love. Yeah. It's yeah. totally yeah. a reasonable thing. <clears throat> it's just for me, it didn't that idea didn't come to me while I was watching it. So Sure. Yeah. I know what you mean. I, I think Pat's Pat's side of things gets a little boost in the way fate kind of just takes over. Right, he uh, just comes, yeah. Climax, it's, and that's... Where he just, he just like, takes the weapon from her and sends her away. Death does. Uh, I guess we can call him Death. <laughs> yeah. I, the guy dressed as a skeleton. Death or fate, it's really... Yes. Um, the kids it's... call him Death. I mean, he's... Well, yes, but the he, kids it's weird because he's fate once. in the beginning and then he becomes Death because, mythologically speaking... Well, they're intertwined. I don't know if anyone yeah. called him fate. I, my understanding. I no, no, but I think he's he was... supposed to be. Yeah, but I think in the first part he's supposed to be fate. In that, like, he's pushing them towards this. Because, like, Orpheus That's... goes into the underworld to rescue Eurydice after she has passed. He doesn't. Yes. Death doesn't kill her. And so, well, yeah, like, and he, it would be fate pushing her towards it, and then death that he fights for her. Right. I you mean, know, that's you know what I'm saying. So, that's, right. I mean, that's just that's a minor issue that's not really relevant. I tell you. And, and, I mean, and on the same turn, the ultimate uh, conclusion of fate is death. Right. Well, yeah. So. I mean, I mean, again, Greek mythologically speaking, not. <laughs> well, uh, it's also important that death kills nobody in this film, right? Right. Yes. You know, death. Death is the thing that's stalking Eurydice that she's afraid of, right? Like she's. Uh, that's one thing that I that I, I really did love about this is, is like the opening scene is Eurydice coming to Rio uh, for, because she's fleeing this this deathly figure right. that she saw that's back in her neat. hometown, and then and she's like lost in the revelers and she's like everybody's jostling her around and then the same thing happens again after, <laughs> and she like, gets the led carnival. by a blind soothsayer oh, yeah exactly. exactly no there are the guy parts of the, it Eurydice is part the, of the story yeah. wonderful in my opinion yeah. like her character and everything about the way her part of the story plays out is just beautiful I love it it's yeah. just that first 30 to 40 minutes of Eur- uh, Orpheus so, with him yeah for me yeah, yeah. I, I so. was just, I was just, you know, like the, later on after the the like during Carnival, she's she's running from death again, and she's being jostled right. around by all these people exactly the same way as when she was running before. And eventually, right, yes. it's her running from death, and Orpheus is wanting to conquer death, which leads to her actually dying and him losing her. So, yeah, yeah. And I think I think that. Uh... It's it's very strange how that plays because that is that seems like a very very Greek idea, mm-hmm. but that's not really how the original myth played out. Right. He wasn't necessarily responsible for her death. Uh, she was bit by a snake, I believe, in the original in a field. myth. Yeah, that's how she died. In yeah, but it, it, there's something <clears throat> about I forget. It's it's even in the Wikipedia. It talks about some there's 
a reason why she's bit by a snake, isn't there? Yeah. Eh, it's oh, not well, really I super important. I honestly can't remember. But it's it's very it's very classic tragedy to have your uh, your desperate attempts to stop fate be what causes the action you were trying yeah, to Yeah, no, it's a, it, it fits so. a, a, a Greek mythology story well, regardless of whether or not it's in the original. Well, and that um, is yeah. the message of the original, right? Like, Orpheus is trying to save Eurydice from death, and then it's his involvement that actually leads to her being lost forever. Uh, yes. So that's, I mean, that is the message right, of the yeah. original story. So. I, I, I'd, I'd say the original message has a bit of lack of faith to it, too. Sure. Um, you know, it's the it's the idea that if he could make it out without, without uh, turning back, if he could trust that she's still there. Right. You know, right, he could make it, but still. Right, the weird twist is no. that, like, uh, he, he, it seems like the ending of the original story is Orpheus just misunderstands the rules. Uh, he yes. misunderstands that they both have to be out before he can look back. Yes, uh, indeed. So I don't, you know, that, that like most of those sort of classic stories, the, the little bits of it don't really matter as much as the, the, the feeling and the, 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 the theme that it's trying to convey. And I think this movie is all about theme and, and feeling and really not about, you know, plot as much. Yeah. You know? no, I, I, I think that's certainly true. Yeah, I would agree. I was a big fan in case you can't tell. Well, I mean, like, <laughs> despite what I'm complaining about, this is still my, probably my favorite adaptation of a, a classical Greek myth I've seen put the film. Mm-hmm. I can't think of a one that's been better. You don't like Hercules the series? Oh, well, I forgot about that. <laughs> Never mind. This is number two. <laughs> I'm so glad. Well, I mean, like, I mean, remember I, Kevin as far as, as far as, um, I mean, obvi- as far as like purposeful, obvious recreations of Greek myths, that is to say, mm-hmm. I mean, there's countless stories that recreate Greek myths all the time, but aren't like the uh, not the director saying, I'm going to make this Greek myth, you know? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just like Romeo and Juliet, as our previous example, lots of that story yeah. gets made right. all the time, but well, some directors set out to make that story. Yeah. Well, and there's something very modern about this this film's take on on Greek mythology in that uh, it seems like everybody already knows the myth, and the myth yeah, is the animation weird. for the story. I loved, you know, that's like weird. like my one of my favorite early moments was you know the mo- the first time you can see Mira's not the one, and you know Orpheus is in the wrong place is when they go to the marriage license office, right, right, yeah. and Are Orpheus says, "My name's Orpheus," and set, and the marriage license guy says, "And you must be Eurydice to Mira," and Mira's like, "No, who the hell's Eurydice?" And uh, from that, yes. you know, I yeah, I, I like that moment. That it's was... such a like a uh, sort of postmodern take on the Greek myth that everybody knows it already, and to a certain yeah. extent, Orpheus makes his journey to the underworld only because he knows he's supposed to. You know, like like it's it's not like this is just uh, this is just happening. Uh, the fact that he and Eurydice belong together is sort of a, both a reference to and a continuation of the the myth. It's very cool. and it's, that's a weird thing though, because at the same time, again, I don't know the. Um... This is not one of the myths that I'm really well acquainted with, but that's a thing that you would also find in Greek mythology where the fates tell you your fate and then you're operating under that influence for the rest of your well, time. That's you know what true. I mean? That that like the fates tell you your fate and then you get into that whole question of like, well, they told me my fate, I have to do the right. things they told me, but do I have to do the things they told me? But then I end up sure. doing the things they told me anyway. That whole thing is also found in Greek mythology, and I thought it was wonderful. I love the the that uh, those references to the myth throughout the movie are wonderful. I thought that yeah. was beautiful. Yeah. I also like that that they accept even the ones who recognize it accept it without sort of winking. Yeah, they're just oh yeah, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, uh, but yeah, I, it. I think I think that kind of helps in that uh, none of these people were really professional actors. Right. Orpheus is played by a soccer star, for instance. Right. Uh, so they don't they they don't play it with a self awareness that I think it might be played with. Right. Um, and that works a lot better. Yeah. Well, I um what one thing I wanted to ask you guys about uh what do you think I mentioned the the uh, the 
we all talked about the sunset scene where Orpheus and Eurydice finally make their connection and whatever, and they see something in each other. What do you think they see? What do you think that's about? What do you think is sort of the, the metaphysical nature of that scene? Right? Hmm. Because it seems to, uh, uh, there's a way of reading this that, and I think maybe the most obvious way of reading this, that Orpheus is just one in a long line of Orpheuses that goes back to the original Orpheus. And Eurydice is maybe in one in a long line of Eurydice that goes back to the same one. Well, so it could be something reincarnation-wise. It could just be some mystical, uh, they see love in each other's eyes. But I was wondering what you, how you guys sort of read that scene. Um, I can see what you're saying about the um, sort of like the continuation of the same story over and over again. But I kind of see it the same way as like, um, I'm not sure if it's, to me, if it's that sort of mysticalness or not. I think the general idea behind it, uh, if, to me, is that this is the sort of story that unfolds over and over again, not because of some mystical, uh, myth- uh, mystical connection, but because it's the kind of story that happens in life all the time anyway. Yeah. Kind of mm-hmm. like your Romeo and Juliet's and other things along those lines where, oh, I'm telling a story that has unfolded countless times throughout humanity. There's more than one Orpheus and more than one Eurydice on the planet at any given time doing this exact same thing. I I think within the realm of the movie, uh, both arguments can be made, whether whether there is some sort of uh, mythological, supernatural thing going on, or if it's just you know, more of a, a metaphorical mm-hmm. um, thing. I think, though, um, I think the director uh, wanted it to be more supernatural. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think he wanted... I feel, um, I'm reading a little bit about the movie, uh, he, uh, he had religious convictions about, about that sort of thing, about, about reincarnation, and the use of the, uh, what was it, the, uh, the, the Brazilian voodoo, uh, I looked up what it was called. Macumba? Uh, something like that. Uh, but anyway, the, the, the church they end up at. Is is obviously a very uh, a very voodoo esque sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and uh, but yeah, it's Umbanda actually is that mm, okay. is what, I, what I read that it was. There's 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 two or three Brazilian practices that that synthesize native religions and Catholicism in a, in a similar manner. But uh, mm-hmm. but in reading about that, uh, reincarnation is very important to that. Uh, that belief system as well, so I think I think hmm, probably right. the way he de- the way he says about the guitar, there was an Orpheus before me, and there'll be an Orpheus right after me. Mm, that's uh, true. And I the fact that, that the guitar talks about Orpheus, yeah, me- means that there's more than just a uh, a well, we're all Orpheus yeah. in our own little yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I can definitely They're, agree with that. And there are like two, I think two or three key things. The two that 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 pop up in my mind to support that view number one for sure the idea that orpheus says there's going to be another orpheus after me and then at the end of the film after orpheus yes. is dead that little kid uh you know takes up the guitar and plays it, uh the guitar and then the sun rises and that little girl who runs up yeah. next to them says yes. you know you're you're orpheus now uh that seems mm-hmm. almost explicitly to endorse this point of view but also <laughs> yeah i i also i also love those little subtle moments when when like it might have been Mira, but it could have also been Seraphina. It says to Orpheus, uh, you know, uh, you don't even know her. And he says something like, yes, I do. And he kind of looks down, you know, and like there's like a yes. lot of weight to that moment. And that to me Absolutely. seems to say these two are people that do know each other. Every time they come back, you know, every time they get bit thrown back in the wheel of reincarnation, these two find each other. And that yeah. they feel that when, they, when they're together, they feel that for the first time in their lives. So. I have I have only just in my mind thought about how uh, uh, Eternal Sunshine on the Spotless Mind plays with, yes. with reincarnation absolutely. in that manner. Yes, that's genius. You're absolutely right. Um, yeah, uh, in that you know, obviously with that movie, it's 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 a forget me not drug or whatever. Uh, but uh, but you know, the idea that that we're destined, no matter wh- how it ends up, right, we're destined to be together, and. If if that's true for Orpheus and Eurydice in this movie, um, 
how they end up is always going to be tragic. Yes. But it's, and that's true in the Eternal Spotless exactly. Mind, but they, exactly. want to, they keep trying to fight it, and they don't want to hit that tragedy. Yeah. Right. Uh, Eternal Sunshine is, is uh, a great example of, like, a real breakdown, postmodern breakdown of, like... Yeah, yeah. You know, absolutely. because, like, we know the tragic ending of the story from the first scene of that movie, and the idea is so do the characters. They know there's going to be a tragic ending to this no matter what, but they keep trying anyway. It's pretty good stuff. Yeah. But anyway... You're absolutely yeah, right. There's that, a connection there for sure. What? I, uh, yeah, and it's it's. I don't know. I don't want to. I don't want to get off track and talk about <laughs> the Eternal Sunshine. Yeah, too we much. shouldn't talk uh, about but, it but, too much. But the idea, the idea that that you know they're they're replaying this in their own lifetime, mm-hmm. whereas whereas Orpheus and they're, they're replaying it throughout history. Right. Well, right, but yeah. that's almost um, a non-point in that, like, yeah. Yeah, they, it's the same net result, right? Like we see the yeah, pa- guitar yeah, exactly. get passed on. Although I like to imagine that that kid's not the next Orpheus, and that the, a, a series <laughs> of children will die in horrible accidents until the real Orpheus gets it. <laughs> uh, but well, I'm, uh, I'm glad that you imagined children. Dying. Well, I don't imagine the actual death of children, but <laughs> in the, in the plot of this story, since that guitar has to get to the next Orpheus, and it's illogical that the reincarnation of Orpheus would be a child who is already alive. Uh, mm-hmm. When he dies, it only reasons to follow that, uh, or it only follows to reason that he uh, somehow that guitar will be lost over and over and over again until the next Orpheus finds Perhaps. it. Perhaps, Perhaps. since since it's not a it's not a fresh born baby getting the guitar. Right, right. Like, <laughs> and I bestow on you the guitar of fate. Although and we plays it on really a child need... in the crib. We don't really know the rules of how reincarnation yeah, works. Yeah, that's true. But exactly. I mean, <laughs> no, I'm not saying that there's rules necessarily. It's just funny to me that, like... Yeah, to think of. He's, yeah. he's Orpheus yeah. only so long as he has the guitar, which makes the guitar the ultimate determiner of Orphean- Orpheusness. Orpheusness. Yeah. <laughs> and that, yeah. like, if the guitar fell into the ocean and a dolphin ended up with it, that dolphin would play out the story of Orpheus in God. Dolphin World? I don't know. Oh, I would, so, I would pay so really, money to see that. would be that the greatest film. movie ever, I know. Oh, yes. my God. Uh, dolphin the, Orpheus. The, oh, man. <laughs> I think the ultimate end of this conversation, though, is, is uh, eventually a Hitler-esque uh, villain. Uh, Burning down all of South America, trying, trying to, to find, find the guitar, guitar of right, Orpheusness. Right. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's just right, you get into that Orpheus weird thing. Guitar. It's like, does that make the guitar the? I mean, like for real. In all honesty, does that make the guitar the primary element of being Orpheus? Almost. Who knows? And it, I mean, that like, you know, the film. Well, is so... If you have the guitar, will Eurydice just find you? Your Eurydice find you if you possess that guitar. They're, okay, the, the film's pretty uninterested in that point, but <laughs> to know, the extent I am that it's totally it, interested in it, <laughs> I get it. I get it. The extent to the extent that the film does sort of respond to that point, a little girl does find. I know <laughs> it's weird. Yeah, so a little girl we've never seen is going to happen when they're like twelve years old. Maybe it's you know it's, the film's very uninterested in that, but I but uh, but but I understand exactly what you're saying. Like well, the, the mechanics of yeah, the, the for passing me that's on almost or... always the primary element of any film that even just even dabbles a little bit into the fantastical is I need to understand the mechanics under which you operate and if you do not provide me that information I'm going to spend most of my viewing time <laughs> thinking thinking, thinking about, yeah. about the mechanics that you didn't bother to think about right yeah I get that and that ruins a yeah. lot of movies for me yeah oh Pat that's terrible. that's too bad I'm so sorry no well it ruins them in the sense that I've stopped paying attention to their plot but it provides <laughs> the, the, the wonders of the of the mindscape my friends can be yes. much more rewarding than actual film. <laughs> I guess I, I'll give. You I mean, that. you can yeah. spend a lot of time thinking about unobtainium. Okay, that's all I can say. About <laughs> an hour and a half, it. precisely, <laughs> or an hour, what, two hours? <laughs> Wondering about the properties of unobtainium and who the hell will... named this damn stuff? Right? Why didn't they just call it very difficult to? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. So, or or maybe if they. Called it ease obtaining. Yeah, uh, right. If they had the whole made movie this could have been different. avoided. Would it have been very easy to find throughout the galaxy? It's, yeah. yeah, it's yeah, exactly. Oh man, it's, it's what's in a name? You know? Yeah. 
Uh, well, I will I will let you keep that belief, if only because <laughs> spending an hour and a half thinking about Unobtainium is probably more enjoyable than watching Well, exactly. I mean, you know, it, it typically happens in less engrossing <laughs> movies. And this was not one of them. I've yeah. only started thinking about the guitar since we started talking about it. Yeah, yeah. It did not ruin this film for Thank me at all. I, like I said, I enjoyed <laughs> oh, it. Uh, we did not talk at all about the music, which arguably is the yes. most important oh. thing in this film. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the music in this movie is beautiful, yes, uh, is. wonderful, and it if if it didn't cause Brazilian music uh, to spread over <laughs> worldwide, uh, it certainly helped it. Yeah, <laughs> I uh, I loved that the movie basically only uses diegetic music. It doesn't really have yes. uh, any Absolutely. background music, uh, and and that what what is so great about that is that there is music running through all of the culture during carnival at that time yes and so you know that there's a soundtrack to the life of being down in that in brazil during carnival that that it's certainly portrayed in this film accurately yeah. or inaccurately right. i mean i can't you know we could also spend a lot of time talking about like the the implications of like cultural analysis for like the fact that like a white french guy sort of breezed into brazil rounded up a you know like an american from pittsburgh to be his eurydice you know yes. we could we could spend a lot of time talking about whether or not this film has the, the cultural authenticity uh, that that it seems to um, but yeah, otherwise, like the the music is certain it lends a lot of authenticity, I think, to the film, and was really, really cool. Oddly enough, I One felt my the favorite. same way about the dancing. I enjoyed the music <laughs> yeah. a lot. The music oh, is think... wonderful, but the dancing, man, that's what Absolutely. kept me going a lot tied. of times. I agree with that the a dancing lot. Dancing is Pat, just yeah. gorgeous, yeah. and they highlight it throughout the film. Like just people yeah. dancing are sometimes the only thing I on think... screen, and it's wonderful. Mm-hmm. I agree. I think my absolutely favorite use of of, of both of those is uh, just after she first arrives and she ends up in the very urban downtown area, and we've got this crane shot and we hear the music very low in the background as if it is far off, and as we as we end up with her on the street, uh, Carnival just explodes downtown very suddenly. Mm-hmm. Mm, yeah, uh, <laughs> and and it's everywhere in the dancing and the music is much louder because it's arrived and someone even says you can't escape it and for a very you know for the for the first half hour or so of the movie she's trying to escape carnival she's trying to avoid carnival that's not why she's here she's here to hide um but carnival is is such the ultimate escapism uh culturally you know in any culture that 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 idea exists and obviously it being it being rooted in catholicism and and uh, Roman face before that, Saturn I, um, it exists pretty much everywhere at this point. But uh, but it's always about, especially especially with with Carnival and Mardi Gras and the use of masks, and it's it's about not caring where you're from or what you are. You become whatever you need to be uh, for Carnival, uh, and it's the ultimate escapism and. She's trying to avoid that while she's trying to escape. Well, at the same I sense, it's just like, interesting to me. at that same time, then it forces me to wonder at the same time is maybe instead of the character of death being portrayed as fate, does that make Carnival more like fate? And that it's sort of trying to latch onto her and force her into a situation that necessarily is going to end with her end. Like, she avoids Carnival for a while, and then it just sucks her in. Maybe. I don't know. I mean, it's not, know, I'm not it's saying a, it is. I'm just saying it's possible. Lots of things are open to symbolism, yes. Pat. Yes. And, 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 and Carnival as the uh, the inescapable, <laughs> as inescapable as death, yeah. um, is, is certainly there. I mean, Carnival is about death, right? Like, Carnival yeah. is about trying to not forget about the fact that death exists. Yeah, uh, exactly. And all of that. So, right. Yeah. It's it's about getting getting away from death and getting away, you know, especially for, for you know, the, re- the reason the parties are so big in the Caribbean and South America is that everybody's poor. Right. <laughs> so you, you can spend an entire paycheck on Carnival, and it doesn't matter because that's... What it's fun for. today. Mm-hmm. That's what's carnival. Well, is and for. It, to me, that lends even more point to that is that if carnival is about escaping death 
and is and escaping death is what ultimately results in her death. Yeah. Then like if, if the escapism of for the attempt to escape death is inherently what her fate is. So it sucks her in and that makes carnival fate. That was really yeah. convoluted, but I hope it's understandable. <laughs> the film, the film is ultimately, it seems pretty ambivalent about whether or not it's appropriate for these these the poverty stricken areas to sort of escape the, from their from their real yeah. life into this, right? Like, you know, like there, there's uh, again pr- problematic cultural readings of this that sort of glorify poverty and say, look at these, you know, poor crazy brown people. Look how well they've adjusted to their poverty, right? Um, but there's a reading of this that says uh, our our need to escape from our lives and to to find these like the the pleasures of carnival is not necessary if we just sort of like focus on you know like if if orpheus and eurydice said we don't need carnival we can just run off together there's a chance that there's a happier ending waiting in this whole thing you know so i yeah i don't know if the film is uh, explicitly on the side of carnival i think it might right be right i about i it. was just saying more in the terms of directly eurydice this eurydice's fate yes carnival yes, being her fate she cannot escape it she even my you were talking about that getting trapped downtown scene more to the point for me is when she is being kind of semi I don't know what the word would be harassed with the people mm-hmm. dance the guys dancing around her and she can't escape yeah. from them yeah. to me yeah, that's at the, at the sort of right the, the tail that end of scene, that. Yeah, right? that's all part to of the me same that's sequence, yeah. right and that to me that's yeah. that's the the moment right there for that particular element is I agree with like you. they are it is just trying to drag her in it is yeah. The carnival is its own essence, its own being, trying to pull yeah, her no, in. No, I think I think there's 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 definitely legitimacy to that. In in that at the end of that scene, uh, someone we don't even see, we don't meet, it's just some guy in a white shirt grabs her and pulls her onto the right. trolley. And the next time we see her, it's her at the end of the trolley line, and Orpheus is there, and Hermes shows her where she needs to go. Yeah, uh, it's it's very. You're absolutely right that the carnival is dragging her in. Mm-hmm. That, that it is as much fate as as anything else that's going on. Um, and you know that's that's one thing the movie the movie is interested in a lot of different ways about. Uh, obviously, it has its own pushing to its conclusion goals to get through, but but it's the inescapability is is you know it's what Greek myth. Right, exactly, that, and for me, that's uh, one of the the key <laughs> elements that I'm hunting for in the film. When I am told by the cover that it is a recreation of a Greek myth, is how is fate destroying and or lifting up these people? Yeah, and for the most part, it's destroying. Well, I mean, um, but at the same yeah, in this one, at the same time, uh, if if Carnival is is fate, if if the fever pitch of music and and dance in that culture is fate, uh, it is also hope at the end you know, mm-hmm. that that right. Everything continues. Well, that and that's Even. but that's that's Greek fate, right? Is that it? It yeah. rolls and on that, and yeah. it doesn't stop, and yeah, yeah, it keeps going with or yeah, without you. Too. Well, I mean, with you, regardless of what you want. <laughs> yes. So, yeah. good movie. <laughs> it is. It is a very Orpheus good in the first moments um, is still a douche nozzle, though. <laughs> Just saying. That's okay. As long as I'm that's an American. Okay. You know, born in 1985, and this is a Brazilian film of 1959 about a Greek myth from well, Greek mythical times. He's a douche nozzle for 30 minutes at least. It's okay. He can be a douche nozzle. He redeems. Yes, he does, and that's great. Right. Yeah. And it makes a great second half of the film. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure what it means that his journey to hell takes him through government bureaucracy. But, uh, you do like that. You know Perfect. exactly what it means. <laughs> I know exactly what that the means. The real question means exactly yeah. what it says. Yeah. Yes. There's a room full of papers called the Missing Persons Bureau, and a man explicitly <laughs> says there are never There's... any people in there. It's only yes. papers. If you want people, you need to get out of that room. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why everyone hates the Bureau of Motor Vehicles. Well, and I think that's right. well, right. <laughs> 
I think that's also interesting to think about. Like, there's there's been even more recently more more documentary films and, and news reports have revealed how like the government of of uh, Brazil is just failing so much to track its citizens and make sure people feel safe. Like the idea of a missing yeah. person in Brazil is to see that it was a, an animating feature of this film all the way back in the fifties, and now there's a lot of talk about like there's all of these undocumented missing people in brazil you know and the government is doing nothing to try and fix that so there's that whole angle present as well there's a lot of layers to this film Mm -hmm. and that's why barack obama's mom loves him i'm sure i'm sure and why theo huxtable (laughs) (laughs) is inspired to go to brazil by the time that's i think i don't know which is a better anecdote frankly I think <laughs> Theo Huxtable great. might be the better one. But. Yeah, <laughs> it's all right. Only it's, it's certainly the one that's more uh, more uh, accessible to me because I don't know Barack Obama's mom. But you know but Theo, Huxtable know Theo Huxtable very well. I do. You know, in my heart, at least. Right. <laughs> so I think that about wraps it up. Do we have anything else to add about it? I mean, it's shot Any... in some very beautiful color. Mm-hmm. Oh it's yeah, no, it's a very gorgeous, vibrant movie. Like, color wise, that's the first thing that struck yeah. me before anything else was, "Wow, this is a very bright movie." Yeah. Especially on comparison to some of the other things we've watched that are from the same era too. Uh, yeah. You know, the, the the other film we're talking about today was shot uh, two years before, and it is. Uh, it looks like it was shot fifteen years before. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but I mean, we'll get to it when we talk about it. But... It's true. It's true. Uh, on that note, our next movie is. Uh... Fellini's uh, Knights of Cabiria, oh, uh, 1957, and uh, it's uh, it's a much more subdued movie than the last Fellini we watched. I think. It, well, it yeah, it would be of... hard to not be. Yeah, that but, uh, the first one, yes, Armacord, is about certainly. the craziest movie ever. Yes, Armacord is very crazy, and this is this is this is years before Armacord, uh, and it's so. Much what more we're really learning is that by watching him in reverse chron- uh, chronological order, is that he was <laughs> ramping up. Yeah, yeah. But you know what? That's okay. And he's still, he's a great filmmaker. Uh, So we'll talk about that next time. Uh, Thanks for listening once again, and we'll see you around. See you next time. Thank you, Stephen, for joining us again, and you are joining us in the the next episode. That's right. We look forward to hearing you again. Thanks for having me. You're very welcome. Should I say something? (laughs) Goodbye. We can leave it on that. Listening to Lost in Criterion, a production of With Two Brains. The show is hosted by Adam Glass and John Patrick Owatari Dorgan. Jonathan Hape did the music, and Adam Glass also edited it all together. Feel free to contact us by email via lostincriteria at with two brains.com or join us on the web at www.lostincriterion.com.